What a crowd. Wow. That was something outside. You should see what's going on. You, got, you have prime real estate. You have to see what's going on outside. You're right. What a crowd in Beaufort. And I got I to gotta tell you, Mr. Trump, here in Beaufort, the people here, I mean, this is the home of Paris Island, the United States Marine Corps premier training facility. And it's the home of Marine Corps Air Station, Beaufort. And the people of Beaufort, they love the military and they love our veterans. And they understand that electing a commander in chief is what this election is all about. Right. What best prepares you to be commander in chief on day one and keep America safe? Well, I'll tell you, we have had such a great response from the military. But, you know, our military has been very much depleted. And we haven't been building it back up the way it should be. And frankly, I've been, I've been talking about this with a lot of people. Uh, and I use the best example, the drug companies. They give to the candidates. And then we don't go out to competitive bidding with drugs. We're the largest purchaser of drugs in the world. And we don't go out to competitive bidding. The reason is you look at a guy like Woody Johnson from Johnson & Johnson. He's a nice guy. But he's in charge of the Jeb Bush campaign fundraising. So when that happens... And then let's say somebody gets in office. There's no way you're going to go out to competitive bid. Well, it's the same thing with the military. We have people and we have, you know, when you, when you look at competitiveness, we're not buying the right equipment. We're not buying anything. You look at what's taking place with our military. It's being depleted. We're going to make it the biggest, the strongest, the most powerful. We're going to build it up. We're not going to be messed around with anymore because believe me, folks, we are being messed around with. We are... We're thin. I looked at uh, General Ordiano when he left. He was saying it's the most depleted since he can remember. And he was talking about a long period of time. So we have to build up our military and we have to take care of our vets. Our vets are being horribly mistreated. We have to take care of our vets. Mr. Trump, just, just really just a few minutes ago, President Obama at the Asian Leaders Summit in California at a press conference, he had something to say about you I want to read, and uh, I don't think uh, you're going to be on his Christmas card list this I year. I don't mind. <clears throat> I've already let me, let me read you what President it's Obama said. It's actually a said. great compliment. <laughs> let me read you what President Obama said and uh, get your response. I'm, I'm quoting President Obama. I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president, and the reason is because I have a lot of faith in the American people. And I think they recognize that being president is a serious job. It's not hosting a talk show or a, re a reality show. It's not promotion. It's not marketing. It's hard. That's from President Obama. <laughs> um, he has done such a lousy job as president. You look at our budgets. You look at our spending, we can't beat ISIS. Obamacare is terrible, we're gonna terminate it, we're gonna absolutely terminate and replace it. I mean, you look at everything, our borders are like uh, Swiss cheese. Uh, this man has done such a bad job, he has set us back so far, and for him to say that actually is a great compliment, if you wanna know the truth. And we just got a call on it coming over. It was, the bridge is like packed, just so you understand. We were like in that car a long time. But we just gave one of the major networks called and they wanted a response. And I said, you're lucky I didn't run last time when Romney ran because you would have been a one-term president. That was my statement to him. And, you know, I was back in McCain when he ran. And, you know, frankly, that was going to be a tough one to win because a lot of things were going wrong, right? for, you know, for a Republican. To win that one was tough, in all fairness to John McCain. We should have won the Romney one because we had a failed president. We had a country that was failing. And we should have won that one. So I backed Romney. I backed McCain. Both lost. And this time I said very simply, I said, we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to do it right. We're going to win. We're not going to take this stuff anymore. We're going to do it right. And we're going to make America great again. You know, our whole theme is make America great again. And that's what the whole deal is. We're going to make America great again. You know, Mr. Trump, we've been fighting radical Islam for a long time. Uh, the Cobra Towers, uh, uh, the bombings of the U.S. Embassy in uh, Tanzania and in Kenya, 1990. In 1998, Osama bin Laden declared war on the United States. 
If Donald Trump had been president of the United States in 1998 instead of Bill Clinton, what would you have done? Well, first of all, I think the World Trade Center would be standing, I will tell you, because if you read my book, The America We Deserve, I have a whole, you know, paragraph or two about Osama bin Laden. And one of the big hosts of one of the shows said, I don't believe it. You know, Trump was talking about Osama bin Laden two years before the World Trade Center came down. Now, I wasn't even a politician. I was a business person, like a lot of you people. And, but I've always been very interested and fascinated by it. And I saw this guy, and I watched this guy, and I read about him, and I said, he's trouble. He's big trouble. And believe me, I would have done something about it. The other thing is, the terrorists that knocked down the building, if you look, the terrorists that knocked down those buildings were in Florida and different places, and they were all working on flying and working on different things. If that had happened with me, it wouldn't have happened with me. We would have had strong policies in place where they wouldn't have been here. They wouldn't have been in the country. Certainly many of them wouldn't have been, and we would have somehow found a way to stop it. As far as Clinton's concerned, he had a shot at Osama bin Laden, and I assume that's what your question yes. really refers yes. to. And he didn't take the shot. He had a shot at taking out, I don't know if you know this, but they were telling him, and for some reason, and he never explained it properly, he didn't take out Osama bin Laden. And had he done that, you would have had the World Trade Center understanding. You wouldn't have lost, th lost thousands. I mean, I have friends to this day there. They're dying. They've been dying for years with the, with the problems of the World Trade Center and the coming down of the World Trade Center. So Clinton should have taken the shot. He, he had everything going. And for some reason, he decided not to. You'll have to ask him. Very sad. Mr. Trump, it's like we keep reading every day more and more scandals with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, how does the Department of Veterans Affairs look under a Trump administration? And what do you do? What's the Trump plan to take care of the veterans? So nobody has been treated with less respect than our veterans. And I really mean that. These are our greatest people. The wounded warriors, the veterans, these are a great people. And I mean, their attitude is incredible. But you look at what's going on and you look at the suicide rate, which is record setting in the history of our country. And so much of it has to do with the scandal of the Veterans Administration. And it's corrupt. It's incompetent. It's everything that can be bad about anything. It's everything that can be bad about government. And President Obama hasn't done a damn thing. He's poured more money, but he has people running it that shouldn't be running anything. And we are going to make the Veterans Administration so good, so proper, which is going to be run so well. We've got some, I've got some of the best people in the world to run it already. They're talking to me about it. We need great managers, but I'll tell you what we need. When a veteran is waiting in a waiting room for six days, and can't get a doctor, and ends up dying. You know, a lot of them, you talk about suicides, a lot of them wait for doctors, and they die before they get to see a doctor for what could be a simple procedure, what could be a prescription, and this is what's happening. We are going to give them the right, and I cover this very strongly, very, very strongly in my, in my you know, we put in policy, and it's, it's covered, I think it's very simple, actually. But they are going to be able to go outside to private doctors, private hospitals, public hospitals, wherever they have to go, because different places have different, different ways of making you better. And we will pay for it, and it's going to be a really good system. It's going to be less expensive, and they're going to end up getting greater service. And we're going to make a determination, but it's something that's so simple. This is something that's so simple that I can't believe it hasn't been done. But they are going to get great service immediate on the spot. Folks, they're waiting four, five, and six days. To, can you imagine yourselves put in that position? If I have to wait 12 minutes for a doctor, I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> These people are waiting. And you know, sometimes they get there and the doctor isn't there, the doctor leaves, or they go on vacation, they go home. We, we can't let it happen to our veterans. We have to take care of our veterans, and we're going to take care of them really well. General Douglas MacArthur once said, there is no substitute for victory. Our current president seems to favor containment. What is your view? Well, I think, you know, I'm always talking about MacArthur and Patton and the great generals are, you know, relatively modern day generals. Uh, these were great 
people, and we have people like that. When you go to the West Point, when you go to Annapolis or the Air Force Academy, we have these incredible young people. They're growing and growing and growing, and we have them all throughout our armed services. We have such talent that it's amazing, but we're not using our talent. And we're also not running it with the generals. We're running it through the White House. We're at a war, and we're, I mean, I've known many cases, and I'm hearing about them all the time, where we're ready to knock out the enemy, and they get a call, do not do it, do not do it, do, you know. Look, we're in a war where people are cutting off the heads of Christians and everybody else. This is like medieval times. We're dealing in medieval times. If you remember the date, the, the debate from just before the last one, where they were talking about torture, and they were talking about waterboarding, and they asked Ted Cruz, who I think is totally unfit to be president, but these are minor details. I really mean that. I think this guy, a senator just came out today, a senator from Oklahoma who's a very highly respected senator, and said he's, he's a, one of the most dishonest people he's ever worked with. That's a hell of a statement. I've never even heard a statement like that. And a respected, one of the most respected senators. But if you look at all of the, you know, the different things that we have to do, we have to get back and we have to get back online and we have to do it right. We're not doing things right anymore. We're not winning anymore. We don't have our right people anymore. We have great, I love General Douglas MacArthur. He's always been somebody I've studied and I respect. General George Patton. We have to win. We have to beat ISIS. Again, it's like we're living in medieval times. We're living in medieval times. We never heard uh, James Foley. All of a sudden you heard a head chopped off. We haven't, I don't think anybody's ever heard of that before. Now all of a sudden it's routine. You see him dropping cages in the ocean and pulling back up a half an hour later, steel cages. We've got to do it. I was against, I should get points for vision because I was totally against the war in Iraq as you probably know, Van, but I was totally against the war in Iraq. I said it's going to destabilize the Middle East, and I totally destabilize it. And in 2003, 2004, they wrote about it. I would talk about it before that. But again, I was a, you know, I was a businessman. I wasn't a politician. But I just said it's going to destabilize the Middle East. Well, it did. It did. And points doesn't matter. You get points. But of all the people running, I was the one that didn't want to do it. And I felt strongly about it. Well, now that Middle East is destabilized, you have the migration. You look at Germany. You look at all of these countries. It's a disaster what's going on over there. And by the way, we should build a safe zone in Syria. And we cannot take any people in this country. We have no idea where they come from. We have... We have no idea where they come from. We can't vet them at all. And you look at the migration, you look at all the young men. I mean, you're looking, there's so many young, strong men. People talk about it. And very, I mean, relatively few women and few children. This could be the ultimate Trojan horse, so we can't do it. Safe zone and get the Gulf states to pay for it. And I would lead that. Who's better at building than I am? But we cannot let these people come into the United States. One of the things that has happened is... I have definitely been the focus on, if you talk about illegal immigration, when I, on June 16th, I talked about illegal immigration. We're going to build a wall, we're going to have strong borders, and that sort of morphed into this, because here's another right. element of it, which is probably even a stronger element of it. You saw what happened with the two radicals that got, they got radicalized. They're married, they killed 14 people, and these people gave them wedding parties and things, and they killed them. They walked in, they killed them. We cannot let this happen. We cannot let these people come in under any circumstances. It can't happen. We have to have a strong country again. We have to be vigilant. We have to be smart. And if we're not vigilant and if we're not smart, we're going to have troubles like you've never seen before. Just look at what's happening over in Europe. It is a disaster. You talk about the refugees, it brings to mind the governors. Are the governors doing enough? What more can they be doing? Well, I don't like what the governors are doing. The governor's saying we have no power. I know in South Carolina they're putting people into the state. And I like Nikki and, and I you know I supported her. I've given her contributions and I give everybody contributions, you know, to be honest with you. But I've given her contributions and she talked about in her uh, speech a couple of weeks ago, she talked about anger and People that are with me, they are angry. And we're not angry people. We're angry at the stupidity of the way our countries run. We're angry that, you know, it's like... 
We have the highest taxes in the world. By the way, we have the highest taxes in the world. The middle class is being wiped out because they're paying so much. And for other reasons, they're being wiped out. I mean, the, the middle class, if you look at how unfairly they're treated in this country, but we have, think of it, we have the highest taxes in the world and we have nothing but problems. And then they say, Donald Trump is angry. I am angry. You know, I was supposed to answer the question because it was given to me. Is it true that you're angry? And I was supposed to say, oh, no, I'm not angry. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled with the way everything's running. We owe 19 trillion dollars. These Republicans, our friends, you know, look, at least we know where the Democrats are coming from. But the Republicans four weeks ago approved a budget that gives Obama every single thing he ever dreamed of. Money for the migration to come in, right? Money for illegal immigrants to come in. Money for everything, everything he wanted. I always say, Obama's a terrible negotiator. He never wins, makes the worst deals I've ever seen. The deal with Iran is the worst maybe I've ever seen. Forget about nations. It may be the worst deal I've ever seen. So incompetent, it's true. But he's a great negotiator where? With the Republicans, okay? If I get in, Believe me, it's going to be a whole different story, folks. It's going to be a whole different story. You talk about people being angry and how the middle class is being treated. It brings up a good, actually a letter to the editor I read this morning in the Charleston Post and Courier from Kirkpatrick Sale. And he was trying to understand the Trump phenomenon that's taking place in this country. Well, and let me tell you, he came to the conclusion... In his letter, he said that it's not new. It goes back to the founding fathers, the Jeffersonians, people who were suspicious of the elites, didn't want a big centralized government. They wanted to return it to the states. And he said that you're the Jeffersonian. Are you the, is this guy right? Are you the Jeffersonian candidate for president? Well, uh, first of all, that's a nice compliment. But honestly, I'm a messenger. I'm, we're all together. Okay, we're all together. One of the, one of, we're all, like, we're all the same. One of the things, and I really mean, I can't stress too hard, you know, I was a big contributor. I gave to everybody. I would, and I understand the power of that. You get tremendous power. And when you look at uh, the electric companies and the lumber companies and all these, and then you wonder why are we making such bad deals? A lot of times it's not that the politicians are stupid, because you say, how could they make such bad deals? They're making them because they're controlled by the special interests, the donors, and the lobbyists. I mean, I know. I've had lobbyists. I know a lot of the lobbyists. Uh, I have lobbyists. I know lobbyists that can do anything. They go into a certain person's office, and that person will vote badly for the country, good for the company or country. You know, when I say country, other country. You know, other countries have lobbyists. I mean, they hire to just drain us. China is taking so much money and jobs and everything out of our country. It's hard to even fathom. If I cut that way, way back, Carl Icahn just endorsed me and other, the big, great businessmen, they would do this. They don't want money. They want, it's, for them, it's sport. They, you know, they love the country in their own way. They love this country and they want to do great. They're great, great people. They're great people at what they do. They're great at business. They're great at negotiation. We have political hacks. We have people that know nothing about negotiation. They got their job because they made contributions to some politician, and they have these people negotiate against China who are absolutely, I mean, these people are trained from the time they're five years old how to, you know, do things. And they end up taking the absolute best of the best. And we have people that don't know anything negotiating with them. China, $505 billion trade deficit in one year. Think of it. How, do you, how can a country even survive? Japan, smaller numbers, but it's a tremendous number. They send the cars in. We take the cars. We give them practically nothing in return. So what kind of a deal is this? We're going to straighten it out, folks. You know, when I first, Van, when I first announced, and it was so exciting, but it takes guts to run for president. You know, it's, I've never been a politician before, but I see how incompetent they are, or dishonest, or influenced. I mean, I don't even know if I call the, the influence really dishonest, but in a form, of, it's a form of dishonesty, to be honest with you. But when I first decided to do this, I said to my wife, look, they're making all these horrible transactions. They were in the midst of this Iran deal, which, by the way, wouldn't you have thought just once or twice they should have gotten up and walked? Did they ever walk? They could have walked and they would have ended up making a much better deal. I tell the story all the time. I don't know if I should tell it now, but I tell the story on the Iran deal that we got our hostages back. Those hostages should have been back years ago. They shouldn't have come back a couple of weeks ago. 
And what you do is you walk in and you say, got to have our hostages back. They'll say, no, you leave. You leave. And you ratchet up the sanctions. And after you ratchet it up, they'll call you back within like uh, two seconds. And they'll say, you've got your hostages. You've got your hostages. You get the hostages back. Then the other part about the deal, we gave them $150 billion. $150 billion. And by the way, the way we made the deal, it looks like a ransom that they got $150 billion. They let four people go. Okay. And, you know, the whole thing is so horrible. So now you go in for the seconds and you say, listen, we got a problem. The problem is we owe $19 trillion. We can't give you the $150 billion. I'm sorry. And you know what? They're going to get angry as hell. They're going to leave and all that stuff. They'll be back in a week or two. We save $150 billion. We, give, we don't know what we're doing. We have people that never once got up and walked away from the negotiation, and they should have walked away five different times. We have people that went into that negotiation and it was reported all over the media that they were dancing in the streets of Iran, burning the American flag, and saying how stupid we were to make this deal. And Kerry never even walked. If somebody did that to me, if I'm making a deal and people are saying, boy, what a stupid deal. This guy's really stupid. What a, this is what they were saying about us. I'm leaving anyway, because I don't want to feel like, I mean, you feel, right? And then you have the people over there, you know, the people that President Obama calls the supreme leader. I will never use that term. Believe me, I will never use it. But Obama, Obama talks about the supreme leader. Well, the supreme leader was over there. And what's he saying? We're stupid. He said, we, uh, we might not make the deal. We think this deal is good, but we may not make it. We hate the American. And I'm saying, why are we dealing like this? What you do is you ratchet the hell out of the sanctions and you make the right kind of a deal, and you get the prisoners back for nothing. They could have had those prisoners back in one session, if I did it, or if I had one of my killers from Wall Street. You gotta pick the best people. You gotta pick the right people. But we had, this guy John Kerry is a total stiff. Okay, he's a stiff. We have, I mean, these are people, Honestly, in the private sector, you'd never hire a person like this. You'd never hire a person. In all fairness, Jeb Bush, you would never hire him in the private sector, okay? Too low energy. You wouldn't do it. Okay. But some of you, about 2% are going to vote for him, so I'm sorry I told you. You talk about getting the right people. And you know, Mr. Trump, that's something Ronald Reagan said. He said personnel is policy. You get the right people, they'll, they'll do the right job. You kind of gave us some insight during, at the debate on Saturday night of the types of people you would appoint to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Tell us about the rest of the Trump administration. How would it look in terms of personnel? Okay, well, first of all, it was very interesting because the debate the other night, I was being hit from every angle, even by the moderator. You know, where they'd say to Bush, uh, well, you know, Mr. Trump said this or that about your brother in 2006. You know, they're trying to start trouble, right? So I was being hit and hit and hit. And I was really happy with the way it came out. I mean, I, was, I had to be very tough because, you know, you, you got to do it. You, I'm being hit by Rubio at the end because he said, oh, well, I agree with them. I said, where did this guy come from? Here's a guy, I watched him. <laughs> it's true. I mean, he's all of a sudden agreeing with Jeb. And I said, I said, Van, I said, where did this guy come from? Two weeks before at the other debate, I watched him melt. He was melting, he was sweating. I thought he just got out of a swimming pool. No, it's true. The hell was this? So, so at the end, so I, you know, so every every different angle, and I had, uh, you know, the other guy just tells lie, 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 and I say, why do we? You know, the good thing is I can defend myself because I have a big audience. So when somebody says like, I am, there's nobody stronger in the Second Amendment running than me. Nobody, nobody stronger. Period. No, it's true. But I have this guy. Ted Cruz, who's a liar. Now, actually, Rubio called him a liar, so it's much better. When a senator calls another senator, and then when a senator from Oklahoma, who's one of the most respected people, say he's a, you know, horrible. I mean, you gotta read this story. It just came out a little while ago. So I feel I can do it. But Rubio did it. When I say Second Amendment, my whole thing is Second Amendment. It's get rid of Obamacare. He'll say, uh, Donald Trump does not want to keep the Second Amendment. Now, how do you defend yourself against that? Every speech I say, we have to protect the Second Amendment. I've been doing this for years. And he goes, Donald Trump, he's talking to some guy on a television show. And I'm watching. Donald Trump does not like the Second Amendment, doesn't want to keep it. How do you defend yourself from that? So, at least I can talk about it. He said, Donald Trump loves Obamacare. 
Donald Trump, from the day it came out, has been against it, and I'm repealing it. I'm gonna, it's going to be repealed so fast, folks, so fast. But here, here's the thing. And I really got the lesson in Iowa because what he did to Ben Carson, honestly, was a disgrace. What, what Ted Cruz, what he did, what Ted Cruz did to Obama, where he said that Obama had quit the race and take our votes, right? Is that right? Carson. I'm Carson. 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 He said, he said that Obama, Obama should have quit the race. It would have been... Wouldn't that have been nice? But he said that Carson had quit the race. That Ben Carson, who's a terrific guy, that Ben Carson had quit the race and he's out and he's gone and take the votes, etc., etc. Okay? And I want to tell you something. That is just dishonest. That is really dishonest. That was a terrible thing. Then he voted, did a voter violation statement and it looked like it came right out of the IRS. And it said, you're in violation, ba ba ba. Essentially, go vote for Cruz and you won't be in violation anymore. But what he did, honestly, what he did to Ben Carson was one of the more despicable things I've ever seen. I tell you what, these politicians are bad news, folks. They do things that are pretty bad. We were talking about Iran just a little while ago. The other side of the world, Kim Jong-un, we've seen the ballistic, more ballistic missile tests, nuclear tests. And Mr. Trump, it's been revealed that going back for many, many years, They've been, they have been financed. The North Korean regime has been financed by the Iranians. How do you deal number with Number one North, partner? How do you deal I mean, with it North Korea? It should have been part of the deal that Kerry made, right? The number one partner of North Korea, the Iranians. I mean, it's the number one thing. And the other one is China. Now look, I told you, China has drained the United States. It's one of the great thefts in the history of our country, what China's done to us. They've taken our money, they've taken everything, right? They've taken everything. We have lost millions of jobs because of China. China, here's the good news, China needs us so badly. China has, we have so much power, they don't understand it, we have so much power over China. And China has real good control over North Korea. Now they say they don't because they like to taunt us. Oh, well, we don't really have that much control. They have almost total control, and you have to remember this, they have almost total control over North Korea. We don't use that power. The power of trade is our power because they take so much money without, Without that trade, China would be in a depression, the likes of which the world has never seen, all right? So we have tremendous power over China. You know, everyone thinks it's the other way around. It's not. The other thing is Iran. Iran is their number one partner. It's their number one relationship. And here we are, made that deal where we give them all of that money, $150 billion. They make that deal. And what happens? I mean, take a look at it. We get nothing. Why wasn't that part of the transaction? Because we have this maniac. Now, with all of that being said and done, you have South Korea makes a fortune. I bought 4,000 televisions. I buy televisions from South Korea. I buy air conditioning units. I don't buy Carrier anymore because they're moving to Mexico. I guess you heard that, right? I'm not, I won't buy them anymore. I'm not going to buy Carrier. Carrier is moving to Mexico. They're closing down. They're moving to Mexico. Forget it. And, and by the way, I hate to say it, uh, they're moving to Mexico. They're getting rid of all those jobs. I saw those men crying. Those people were crying. They had their jobs. They didn't even know about it. Let me tell you something. I would tell Carrier, guess what? You're going to make air conditioners in Mexico. Good luck. When you sell them to the United States, we're charging you a 35% tax. Every air conditioner comes across the border, 35%. And you know what? You know what they're going to do? They're going to say, uh, if he really means that, we're not moving to Mexico. Okay, we're going to stay in the United States. It's crazy. But we have a tremendous, go back to South Korea, they make a fortune. We protect them. We have 28,000 soldiers on the line between North and South Korea. Think of it. 28,000 soldiers. And we, we're taking care, we are protecting them. They wouldn't be there if it wasn't for us. They pay us peanuts. Why are we doing this? We protect Japan. We protect Germany. A lot of people don't even know that. Do you know that if Japan gets attacked, we have to protect them. If we get attacked, Japan does not have to do anything. It's always like, way. Most, most people, do you know that we protect Japan? We get peanuts, like peanuts. When you look at our military budget, it's, it's much higher than anybody else's by a factor of many times, like 10 times. Part of the reason is we're protecting everybody. And we protect Saudi Arabia. Now, until the oil went down, so now they're making less, but they're still making a lot. Saudi Arabia was making a billion dollars a day. We protect Saudi Arabia. So why isn't Saudi Arabia paying? We have military bases that we pay rent on to Saudi Arabia, okay? We've got stupid people running our country. 
I mean, we have people that don't know what they're doing. Saudi Arabia is making a billion dollars a day. I know Saudi Arabia. I have many friends. They buy my apartments. How can I dislike them? Right? China too. They buy my apartments. They pay me numbers. I'm very happy with them. Okay. <laughs> but, but think of it. Saudi Arabia, a billion dollars a day. And without us, they wouldn't be there. They would have been gone a long time ago. They would have been gone a long time ago without our protection. We get peanuts. It's going to change, folks. It's going to change. We have no choice. We can't, owe, we can't have $19 trillion in debt because of the horrible omnibus budget. They call it omnibus. But because of the recent budget, it's going to go up another $2 trillion. So we can't have $21 trillion in debt and protect Saudi Arabia and everything we touch, we lose money on. You know, we lose money on every single thing except student loans. Student loans. And the poor students are getting killed. No, no, the students are getting killed, by the way. It's the only thing. It's practically, it's one, of the, it's one of the few things that we actually make money on as a government. But, which is, you know, the whole thing is ridiculous. But we have to change our whole way of thinking. Because otherwise, we're not going to have a country left. We're not going to have anything left. You're talking about the Chinese a while ago. The Chinese and the Islamists are killing us in cyber warfare, both economically and from a national security standpoint. How does a commander-in-chief, Donald Trump, win the cyber war? Well, the cyber war, so, I mean, you're talking about a whole new form. You look at what's happening with us right now, where they're taking our secrets. Of course, they're probably getting, you know, the emails of Hillary Clinton. Do you believe? <laughs> no, you believe that. You believe that. I mean, look at the fighter, the F-35, the new fighter, and then all of a sudden China comes out with a fighter. It's almost like identical. The color, you know, the whole thing, the shape is like, I say, what are you talking about? Did you see the two pictures of theirs and ours? It's almost identical. They obviously got it, and supposedly they stole it from us. Look, we have to be so careful. We have to be so smart. We have to be, and you have areas right now in South Carolina where cyber is going to be a very big and important factor because you have the key... You know, in this whole country, this is where it's at. This is going to be so important. And that's going to be one of our most, because the world is changing. The world is changing. That's going to be one of our most important sectors right there is in the military way. The cyber is so important. But you look at what's happening with Russia. You look at what's happening with China and how they're trying to get all of our secrets. Can't let it happen. So it will be very important. You've come out very strong against Common Core. Why is Common Core bad? Because you have to educate your children locally. I've seen it. You can't. You can't. You can't have bureaucrats from Washington. I'm, I'm sure some of them care, but for the most part, they don't. You can't have bureaucrats from Washington taking care of the education of your children. And I've seen local education where the parents are on the school boards and everything. It's, it's beautiful. Even when their children graduate, they stay and they, they have, they, there's love, there's total love. The other way, it's just a big bureaucracy. And there's another reason, if you look, we are ranked number 30 in the world in education. We spend more money per pupil than anybody else by a factor. You look at uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, China. These are the places that are really top of the line. But we spend, right now, we spend much more per pupil than any other country in the world by, by a factor where second place doesn't even exist. It's so far behind, okay? Spend more, and yet we're number 30. It's a little bit like on the election, you know, in New Hampshire, which I won by a big margin, uh, which was good. They're, those people are great. They were so great. But think of this. So I spent $3 million. Bush spent $46 million. I came in first, he came in toward the bottom of the pack. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that as a country? Wouldn't that be nice when you think about it? And so in education, we spend the most and we're doing terribly. We're way down at the bottom of the pack. And uh, we can't have that. Education is so important. You know, the American dream is never going to happen unless we have great education. So important. What's your view of Social Security and what steps would you take to strengthen it? We're going to save it. We're going to bring our jobs back from all over the world, Mexico, from all over the world. And by the way, remember this. Remember I said it. It'll stop with me. But remember I said it. Mexico is the new China. You look at what's going on in Mexico, the big Ford plants all over the place. There was another article. I talked about the Ford plant for two years. Now there's an article two days ago in the Wall Street Journal where Ford is doubling up. They're going to have many, many more things are going down to Mexico. We're going to build the wall. Believe me, we're going to build the wall. Wall's going to be built. Wall's going to be built. And, and, 
Who's going to pay for the wall? Yes. Better believe it. And they are. You know, the politicians come off the stage. They say to me, and they're nice people, they're fine. They say to me, Donald, you know for a fact, I mean, give me a break. You know that Mexico's not going to pay. I said, of course they are. We have a trade deficit with Mexico that's so massive, the wall is peanuts by comparison. And I'm not even talking about the drugs that come pouring across the border illegally because you want to see real trade deficits. The drugs, we get the drugs, they get the cash. No good, no good, no good. Uh, you know, up in New Hampshire, where, where they have an amazing problem, because you look at New Hampshire, it's so beautiful in the woods and everything is so nice. And even then it was snowing. I said, please don't snow during the election, please. So it stopped, I got lucky. I said, please. Because, you know, it snows, you don't know, maybe, I don't know. I think my people would come out, but you never know. And by the way, speaking of that, on Saturday, will you please come out and vote so we can... <laughs> so important. So important. Come out and vote. we got to do that. You know, with, with all of everything that we're all working for, uh, we got to come out and vote and, and just win and win big. The bigger the mandate, like up there, we had a tremendous, with 36 percent, which is a lot. And, you know, that was a lot bigger than anticipated because we won by, I guess, like 20 points. And it's a tremendous mandate. And when you can do that here, and I tell you, we have the same feeling here. The people here are so incredible. And, and I know the people here from long before the whole electoral situation. I've had, I have so many friends in, in the area. And I love it. I love the place. But we have to come out and we have to vote. Saturday is such a big day. And if we can do Saturday, if we can do really well, we can literally run the table and we can win this whole thing and we can turn this country around and we can use common sense and make our country great again. And make our country great again. So, but just a second and thank you. Oh, I like that guy, he stood up. But just a second on Social Security. So, you know, I see the other people and they're all saying, you gotta cut this, you gotta raise the age, you gotta do all of this. There is tremendous waste, like at the VA, there's tremendous waste, fraud and abuse, and everybody wants to get rid of that. But we are going to bring all our jobs back. We're going to build our economy. We're going to become rich again. We're going to become strong again. And we're not going to cut Social Security. You've been paying into it forever. And it's unfair that you do it. And there's no reason to have to do it. And we're not going to do it. And I'm the only one that says that on this side. But we're not going to do it. How does tax policy look under a Trump administration? Well, we put in a very big policy paper, Van, and it's really what it is, is a massive simplification of what we have right now. Uh, you will not need H&R Block ripping you off anymore. You won't need anybody. You're not going to be paying a lot. It's simplification. The rates are much lower. We have four rates, and it's much, much lower. Middle class is going to be, as, as I told you before, going to be so much better. We have a problem in this country, and the problem is corporate inversion, which the politicians know nothing about, where we have corporations, you know, Pfizer is leaving for Ireland. I don't know if you've seen that, but Pfizer is a major company. They're leaving for Ireland. Many, many companies are leaving the United States for two reasons. Taxes are too high, and the other one is they have billions and billions of dollars, two and a half trillion dollars to be exact, probably a lot higher than that, two and a half trillion dollars. In other countries, they can't bring the money back in. And it shows you how bad Washington is because every single, it, it's an amazing thing, every single politician practically, Democrat and Republican, want, they agree that the money should come back in. Who wouldn't agree? And they can't make a deal. That's where you need the leadership. You need a president that's going to sit them in a room and just grab them and cajole and do whatever you do and get it done. But they're leaving to get their money. They're leaving because they can't bring the money in. They're leaving to get their money, and they're leaving for lower taxes. We've got to work on that fast because we're going to lose a lot of our greatest corporations. When you lose Pfizer, and others have announced already, they're leaving the country. And they're leaving thousands and thousands of jobs behind. Great jobs, not the bad jobs that we're creating. We're now creating part-time jobs and bad jobs. You know, when you look at those phony reports, they're phony reports. We're, we're doing bad, bad jobs, lousy jobs. They're called bad jobs. They're lousy. And we're also doing part-time jobs. When you have companies like Pfizer leaving, those are great jobs. Those are high-paying, great jobs, important jobs. And these people are all out of work. Thousands of people are out of work. Same thing I can say this with Carrier. You look at when Carrier Air Conditioners moves into Mexico. You're losing, I guess it was 1,400 jobs at least that they're talking about. But those are good jobs. And now what are those people going to do? What are they going to do? And by the way, what I said about Carrier before, I mean that. 
unless you do something like that, now you'll have the, the free market people. I call them in many cases the not so smart people because we all want free markets. But the markets have to be fair. When China sends all its stuff over here and we send them a fortune of money and we send stuff over there and they won't accept it. I have friends that are manufacturers. You can't do business in China. They, these are smart cookies. These are great manufacturers, great products. They send their stuff into China and they get sent back. And then when they do get in, they have a huge, they call it a tariff. They have a huge tariff to pay in China. We don't do that. It's not fair. And then when China devalues, they're the king of devalue. I mean, they, they do it like great chess players, like grandmasters. They devalue their currency to a point. They have it down to an absolute science. It makes it impossible for our companies to compete with China. Japan has done an unbelievable job of devaluation. And our companies are having a hard time. I talk about a friend of mine who's an excavator. And he always buys Caterpillar tractors. Now he just put in a massive order for Komatsu tractors. And he said to me, they devalued the yen, Japan, to such an extent that I could no longer... He felt very badly, because he's always bought... He's a pretty big com you know, company. They've always bought Caterpillar, always. And now he's buying Komatsu tractors. And he feels bad. He said, I never bought this before. I said, are they good? Yeah, but they're not as good. But they're good. And they're good enough. But I had an obligation to my family, my company, my employees to buy where I could get the best deal. And he bought Komatsu tractors because of the devaluation of the yen. And take a look at what's happened to Caterpillar stock. You know, we just have leaders that don't get it, and we are getting killed on trade. I mean, if you think of it, we're getting killed everywhere. We're getting killed on trade. We're getting killed at the border. We're getting killed with the military. We, we, we can't beat ISIS. Can you imagine telling the name was, you mentioned Van General Douglas MacArthur or General George Patton. Can you imagine telling them that we can't beat ISIS? They'd beat ISIS in about two days. But, you know, it's a different mindset and it's honestly, in terms of somebody that really loves the country, it's so sad. That's why I'm doing this. It's so sad to watch. You, you talked about Pfizer going to Ireland. Uh, last fall, I believe you were critical of Boeing's decision to open up a facility in China. Uh, they've lost uh, market share to Airbus. Boeing is very important to the people in the low country. What's going on here, and how would President Trump deal with it? Well, I'd be concerned about Boeing here and Boeing in the United States period. Um, first of all, Iran got all of this money. And did you notice where they bought their airplanes? They bought 118 you know, big aircraft. And guess where they bought them? From Airbus. They didn't buy them from Boeing. So Iran has this money that we just gave them, and now they're on like a shopping spree, like you go to the store. And they went to the store, and they went to Airbus, not Boeing. I don't even think they bid it out with Boeing because they don't want to do business. Who would make a deal like this? It's just sick. So they bought 118 aircraft from Airbus, which is European. They went to Italy, bought tremendous. They're buying missiles from Russia. They're buying nothing from the United States. Shouldn't be buying missiles anyway, wouldn't you think? But they're buying missiles from Russia but they're buying nothing from the United States. Now, here's where you have a little problem, maybe a big problem eventually. When China ordered airplanes, they made Boeing, as you probably know, build, and they're building a massive, massive, huge aircraft plant in China. It's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, and someday they're gonna to come to you, unless I'm president, and they're gonna say, we're not going to need your plant anymore in South Carolina. Okay, we're not going to need your plant because we're going to have a plant that's going to be in China and we're going to devalue our currency and we're going to do all the things that they do better than anybody else because we don't have people that know how to play that game because we're foolish. And they're going to take your business away or they're going to take a lot of your business away. So Boeing has to be very careful in terms of actually you have to be very careful more so than Boeing. But what China did is when they took that, they gave them a fairly big order, not even that big of an order. But they gave them a fairly big order, and they want it all built. They want massive plants built in China. And they have the intellectual property. They took a lot of secrets away that Boeing would never give. And give and they took, now, they're going to steal those secrets anyway, so I don't even know it's a big deal, because they steal them anyway. You know, you talk about cyber, right? They take them anyway. But they took them. This way, they took them legally. At least they put it in a contract, all right? It's too bad Boeing has to do it. But you have to be careful, because China is building a massive, you know, infrastructure for airplane manufacturing. And someday you're going to come and you're going to say, you know, I remember Trump. He was sitting on the stage with a very handsome man. And he said this was going to happen when Boeing announces they're going to not build anymore in South Carolina. So you have to be very careful.
It's not that far off. Have to be very careful. And politicians aren't going to understand this, folks. It's January 2017. And let's say there's a President Trump in the White House. What's the first thing you would do to strengthen the United States relationship with Israel? Well, I think it would be automatically strengthened if, you know, I was the Grand Marshal of the Israeli Day Parade a number of years ago. Actually, at a very bad time for Israel when a lot of people, it was actually dangerous to do it. But I've had a very, very strong relationship with Israel. I have a great relationship with the leaders of Israel. And I think that, honestly, I don't have to do very much. I think if I win, they would be very, I would have never made this deal. This deal, I don't mind making a deal. But Israel is, is just absolutely devastated by this deal with Iran. It's just so bad on so many levels. If you look at what's happened with Iran, it's so incredible. Because not only do they have this great deal, now they have this big bundle of money, they're going to have all the nukes they want, and they're going to cause nuclear proliferation. But what else did they get even better? They got Iraq that they've wanted forever. They'd fight and fight and fight, back and forth, fight, fight. They rest. Then they fight because the two militaries were the same. They were the same power, basically. And they'd never get anywhere. This would go on, so on. I mean, all of the military people know exactly what I'm saying. It was like automatic. They stopped each other. Now we've decimated Iraq, the military, and Iran has got, we've taken everybody out. We can't even call them. We can't even make a phone call to Iraq. Think of it. We spent $2 trillion. All of our great soldiers were killed and so badly wounded. We have nothing. We have not anything. Iran is going to take over. I mean, they've already, essentially, they've taken it over. But Iran takes over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Now they take over Yemen, but they don't really want Yemen. They want Saudi Arabia because that's right on the line. You know, the Yemen line is the big border with Saudi Arabia. They, they don't want Yemen. They want the oil in Saudi Arabia. So we need a different leader. We need somebody that's respected. We need a military that's much stronger. We need a military that when we speak, we can really speak. We don't need nuclear where, I don't know if anybody saw the 60 minute report where they did, which should have never been allowed to go out, should have never been, where the nuclear, we don't even know if they work. Did anybody see that report? It was a scary report, so bad. We are so far behind the times militarily and we have to strengthen it up. I'm, I'm so much into that. And you know, honestly, uh, making our military strong and modern and really, really top of the line, it's probably the cheapest thing we can do. How do we stop the expansion of ISIS and how do we defeat radical Islam, which is now on American soil? Well, we have to hit it very hard. ISIS, we have to hit so hard. Again, the, you know, what they're doing is incredible. They're intimidating. They're using our internet system better than we, we came up with. We invented the internet. They are radicalizing our youth. They're taking them using the internet. And we can't allow that to happen. We're not going to allow it to happen. We have to hit them hard there, and we're going to work on that. You know, I told people, we, can, we have to stop them at the internet level, and then we have to hit them so hard like they've never been hit, because we do have to end it. Again, I was not in favor of going into Iraq. We have no choice. We have to hit ISIS so hard, and we will end it. We have people, look, I've spoken to many of the military. If we wanted to knock them out, we would knock them out fast. We're being stopped politically. We're being stopped politically from knocking them out. They will get knocked out so fast, your heads will spin. I'm telling you, they will get knocked out very, very fast. And we have no choice but to do that. Uh, radical Islamic terrorism and radical Islam, we have to find out what's going on there, folks, because there's some bad stuff going on there, some really bad things. Like the two people, the two people that were radicalized married, they, were, they had bombs all over the floor of their house and, and unit. They had bombs all over the floor. Other people saw the bombs. Why weren't they reported? Why weren't they reported? People saw the bombs. It now comes out. Why weren't they reported? They weren't reported because maybe people didn't mind if they were going to do damage to the United States. Those people are just as guilty in a certain way. Okay? And whether it's dealing at the mosque level or any other level, if we're going to be smart and if we're going to be sharp, we have to be vigilant. And we are not being vigilant. And we have, again, a president that doesn't want to even mention the word or the words. You know, if he's not going to say radical Islamic terrorists, he won't say the words. 
and you're never going to solve the problem. So we have a problem. And, you know, I called for a ban, a temporary ban. And people said, oh, that's terrible. Three weeks later, they're saying, you know, that's a great idea because they're seeing what's going on. And, and, and honestly, all you have to do is look at Europe. We've discussed this before, but all you do is just take a look at Europe. Look at what's going on over there with the tremendous crime wave, the tremendous problems. Uh, we just can't. We have enough problems in the United States without having that one. And that one's a beauty. Somebody said, well, we don't think it would be more than 10% of the people that came in would cause trouble. 10%? The two people, the two people that got married and radicalized. I guess he was radicalized by her. Who cares? These two people, look at the damage. Look at the horrible destruction. Two people. And they talk about 7 to 10%. Forget it, folks. Not going to happen. And if, if I get, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you know, we're, just so you know, we're taking thousands of them in as we were sitting here talking about this. In the meantime, there are thousands coming in, partially because of the budget that was passed recently, but there are thousands coming in. If I get in, I hate to say it, they're going back. They're going back. They're going back. I think it's safe to say you know something about social media and Twitter. Um, how do we fight ISIS on social media and are, is, are Facebook and Twitter doing enough? Well, you, can, you have to use. I mean, we were the inventors of all this stuff, and you have to use it. It absolutely is imperative. It's great stuff. I use it to Twitter and the Facebook. I have millions of people. I have, I have like, I guess, 12 or 13 million people between Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I use it. I'm sort of like a modern person, right? I communicate. It's unbelievable. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little statement about somebody, you know. I'll say, Jeb Bush is a total stiff. <laughs> and the next minute, I'll be in my apartment, I'll be have the news on. We have breaking news, uh, Donald Trump. It's like within 30 seconds. I say, I say, Ted Cruz is a terrible, terrible liar. The worst I've ever seen. We have breaking news, Donald Cruz. We have to, honestly, we have to use this because it's a modern, it's actually a great way of communicating. Now, we have to use it in moderation, perhaps, and if you become president, it has to be toned down a lot. I fully understand that. I'm like, you know, an intelligent person. I'll tone it down a lot. But I will say it is an amazing way to communicate, uh, and we should be not allowing them to use our way of communicating because what they're doing, they, you take a look. You have kids that you wouldn't even think about. They're being radicalized over the internet by ISIS. We, I know how to stop it. We will not let that happen. And by the way, one thing, when they go out and they won't go, want to go fight for ISIS, you know, someday they're not going to go out. They'll fight for ISIS within our lines. But when they go out, they want to fight for ISIS, they're never coming back into this country again. How about what? King Abdullah of Jordan came to the U.S. Congress, met with Republican leaders last year complaining that our State Department was putting up all kinds of bureaucratic roadblocks, things that he needed to take the fight to ISIS or radical Islam. How would you work with moderate and reform Muslim and Arab leaders in the Middle East like King Abdullah, and how would they uh, fit in with your foreign policy? Well, I know that situation very well. And uh, he and others that are on our side wanted to do certain attacks that would have wiped out big sections that would have been very positive in terms of hurting ISIS. And our State Department wouldn't allow them to do it. They said, don't do it. You do not act. Do not. You know, they have a lot of power because we give weapons. We give weapons to everybody, by the way. We give so many weapons and we don't even know for the most part who we're giving them to. And, you know, there are many cases, like the whole fight in Syria, we give weapons to the freedom fighters, right? Here we go with the freedom fighters again. The freedom fighters usually end up being worse than the people that are there in the first place. But we give weapons, a bullet's fired in the air, and the enemy takes over the weapons. You know, we have 2,300 uh, Humvees that are totally armor-plated, the best in the world, right? A f they have a fight. First of all, can you believe 2,300? And I always go, you mean 23? You mean 2.3. You, you don't mean 2,300. The enemy takes all our equipment. A young man comes back. He's a, a, the son of a friend of mine. He's been over there for a long time, two or three, I guess, maybe four years. And he said the most, the hardest part, the hardest thing he 
does. And the thing he hates the most, he looks at the equipment. The enemy has better equipment than we have. They have our best equipment. We give it to people to use, and the enemy captures our equipment, and they have better equipment than we do. We're fighting with older equipment, like the Humvees. You know, a lot of our wounded soldiers, our wounded warriors, they were horribly hurt in Humvee accidents where, you know, a mine would go off and they'd get their legs blown off, their arms blown off, they'd just be decimated. And it, with, the new, with the new stuff, you, you go up in the air, but you're okay, okay? I mean, you know, these things are amazing. And they're, they're very strong, very, very protective. The enemy has them. The enemy takes them. And we're still driving around in stuff that's not protected. Uh, I, I just tell you this, Van. Uh, if you people go out, and if you do your thing on Saturday, it's so important. You're going to be so happy. You're going to be so proud of what's going to happen with the country. Because some of it's common sense. Like somebody said, are you a conservative? I'm, I'm really a conservative, but I'm also a common sense person. I'm a common sense conservative, you know. But some of, I mean, you know, and you know what I'm talking about. Some of the stuff is so, so out there. We have to be, I think conservative is great, but we have to be common sense conservatives. We have to be smart. But I, I can tell you, first of all, it's an honor having so many people. It's an honor having those rooms all filled up. It's an honor having thousands of people outside that couldn't even get in. And they're still probably on the bridge trying to get across. But you know what? <laughs> there is a movement going on out there. It was in the cover of Time Magazine last week. There's a movement that's unbelievable. And it's almost like a movement of common sense and business and heart, too, because we have heart. We have to take care of our people. We want to have housing. We want to have education. We want to have borders. We want to have all these good things, Van. And I'll tell you what, I think that, you know, in two years and three years and four years, hopefully you'll all remember this because you're going to see things happen that are going to be so much good. And we're going to start winning again as a country. We're going to win a lot. We're going to win again as a country. And you can be proud of your country again. So I appreciate it very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be in Buford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Saturday, get out and vote Saturday. Thank you, everybody.